guest, uh, the main speaker from the UNIA ACL side. Um, we wanted to invite a uh, big, very good, well-respected reverend in the city, uh, the reverend of the beloved community church down in the uh, Pittsburgh area of the city. Uh, please put your hands together and help me introduce Reverend F. Keith Slaughter. Thank you, brother. Oh. Greetings, everyone. Yeah, voice. Uh, I greet you and I thank you for your presence. I greet you in the name of our Creator, in the name of all of the Orisha and the ancestors. Uh, I greet you uh, in the name of peace, and I pray that peace will be with you on this day. I have prepared for you a speech to be delivered and I am determined to deliver it to you. Uh, my brother said that, uh, inferred that I am I'm special, but no, you are, you are special, so I prepared special words for you. And it is my prayer that you would, would hear uh, what I'm saying in the spirit that I offer it. Uh, I've labored to learn of a man born by the name Malchus Mosiah Garvey, later known as Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And let me be clear from the outset of this message. I am by no means a scholar in the area of Garvey or Garveyism. I'm just a black man who loves black people and who has respect enough for the memory of the man to do the research necessary in order to bring you words that might be enlightening. Since ever I heard his name, I was intrigued by who he must be. As a child, I remember some elders using his name as a pejorative to insolence and disobedience, cautioning a mannish boy saying, don't be no Marcus Garvey. I never knew the meaning of it all, but I kept it all in the back of my mind because I learned early that whatever white folks and black folks who love and feared white folks said could not be taken at face value. Mm. So when I began my undergraduate education, no mention of Garvey was made by any instructor that I encountered until I began to pursue a history degree at Tuskegee University in the mid-80s. My professors were Frank J. Tolan and Willie Fluker. They taught me revolutionary and liberative versions of history. They became my teachers and my heroes because they introduced me to black people of substance and power. Mm. Connecting me to ideas that I could be substantial and powerful. But more than that, uh, there was no, if, if there was no fluker, if there was no Tolan, no doctors, Carolyn McCrary, Mark Lomax, and Reuben Warren, there would be no F. Keith Slaughter. If there was no J. Robert Love and no J. Albert Thorne, no Booker T. Washington, there would be no Malchus Mosiah Garvey. And let me share with you why I say what I say. This is what I believe celebration of the life and movement born out of the struggle and the genius of the Honorable Marcus Garvey is all about. It's all about the serious consideration and realization of connection and overlap of experience. The experience of the black man in a world poisoned by the toxic and bitter bile of racism, white supremacy, patriarchy. It's about unity, solidarity, cohesion, and commitment to the liberation of black people, by black people, 
as the ultimate response and cure for the disease of white supremacy. From my perspective, Garveyism as a movement is undergirded by philosophical inclusion of religious, academic, political, economic and social ideas and approaches and practices and nuances and perspectives and social ideas. And it has been indelibly shaped and molded into what it is that we call black culture. Black culture has been indelibly shaped and defined by Garveyism. And as a movement, it refuses to die. In the text and original man, The Life and Times of Elijah Muhammad, Claude Andrew Clay III writes the following. In a sense, the UNIA was as much a religious movement as it was a political force. The desire of Garveyites to achieve the redemption of Africa from white imperial control often took on spiritual significance. Moreover, many of the hundreds of thousands of individuals who joined the movement described their attraction to Garvey's ideas as akin to a conversion experience. Mm -hmm. Indeed, Garvey, like Fard Muhammad, utilized the symbols of Christianity to draw African Americans into his organization. The God of the UNIA was portrayed as black, and each chapter of the organization was authorized to select a chaplain to lead them toward their spiritual aims. The favorite rallying cry of the movement, one God, one aim, one destiny, summed up both its nationalist and its religious underpinnings. It's clear that the UNIA was conceived as a religious entity that used the academic or information arm known as the Negro World, which was the newspaper that was founded by Garvey, to put forward ideas for political change, economic empowerment, that ended up resulting in social transformation. And these ideas were just as relevant for revolution then as they are for this right now moment. Somebody shout Ashe. Marcus Garvey and the institution that he founded, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, is the largest mass movement of African people in modern history. It has been said that politics is war without the firing of a gun. It may be asserted that Garvey declared war on white supremacy without, uh, without firing one single shot. He established at least 700 branches of the UNIA in 38 different states at its pinnacle of power in the early part of the 1920s. In the 1920s, perhaps none of you were around, I know that I wasn't, but in the 1920s, black people had just recently come out of being enslaved. It was, it was unheard of for a black man to speak any words back to a white person of any kind. And this is the setting in which the Universal Negro Improvement Association was founded. Yes, he established over 700 branches of the UNIA. And one writer has suggested that Garvey was born on August the 17th of 1887 in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. Due to the economic hardship of his family, he left school at age 14 and learned the printing and newspaper trade. He began, he became interested in politics and soon he was involved in projects aimed at helping those on the bottom of society. Unsatisfied with his work, he traveled to London in 1912 and stayed in England for two days, for two years rather. During this time, he played close attention to the controversy between Ireland and England. And what he did was look at what their tactics were, and he looked at how nationalism could become the tool, the fulcrum, the lever that, allowed, that would allow for black people to grab a hold 
of some kind of power. After World War I, Garvey surveyed the racial situation in America. Garvey was convinced that integration would never happen and that only economic, political, and cultural success on the part of African Americans would bring about equality and respect for black people around the world. With his goal, he established the headquarters of the UNIA in New York, in Harlem, in 1917, and began to spread a message of black nationalism and the eventual return to Africa of all people of African descent. His brand of black nationalism had three components. Unity, somebody shout unity. unity. Pride in African culture. Pride in African culture and complete autonomy. complete autonomy. Garley believed that people of African descent could establish a great independent nation in their ancient homeland of Africa. He took the self-help message of Booker T. Washington and adapted it to the situation he saw in America, taking a somewhat individualistic integrationist philosophy and turning it into a more corporate, politically minded, nation building message. In 1919, Garvey purchased an auditorium in Harlem and named it Liberty Hall. There he held nightly meetings, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays, not just on Saturdays, but every night he held meetings and sometimes as many as 6,000 people would be in attendance at his meetings. Yes, in 1918, he began a paper called the Negro World, which by 1920 had a circulation of somewhere between 50,000 and 200,000 subscribers. Ah, the UNIA is estimated, listen to this y'all, to have had a membership of over six million members at the height of its popularity among black people the world over. Yeah. Garvey was clear as it relates to the necessity of literacy, study, writing, and reflection on the issue at hand. Only out of deep, persistent thought about a subject will one render expertise in that area of knowledge. To lead, one must have knowledge of the subject matter from the perspective of scholarship, but one must also have an experiential relationship that generates a sense of passion for the work to be done. Garvey was an intellectual, let us be clear, disparagingly described as a little, fat, black, ugly man with intelligent eyes by W.E.B. Du Bois. Fortunately, he rose above the hatred projected at him by some of his own and did the work of organizing to bring about the greatest good for all black people, haters included. The concepts of black nationalism and later pan-Africanism gained prominence and serious recognition because of the intellectual scholarship and writing of Garvey. He acknowledged that he gained his first reasonable exposure to race consciousness through the pages of another paper called The Advocate, a newspaper published by a black man who became his mentor by the name of J. Robert Love. If you check me out, I'm going somewhere and you'll see. C. Boy James, in his book entitled Garvey, Garveyism and the Antimonies of Black Redemption, has written with reference to Dr. J. Robert Love that love was to Jamaica what Du Bois was to America. But love was more because he was the singular force of its kind. While in the case of Du Bois, there were many compatriots themselves, also publicists, spokesmen, and agitators of black people's rights with, ac with accessibility to the press and of the public media. Men like doctors Love and Du Bois were not men whom people necessarily loved or with whom people frolicked. 
They were men to be respected and even feared. Because these Negroes did not play about black liberation. I say. Do you see? I say. Well, well, and inevitably, by circumstances, men whom other black men were forced to look at were forced to either follow them or get the hell out of their way because they didn't play. And so, Du Bois sometimes influenced the radical behavior of A. Philip Randolph, a Chandler Owens, a younger Ralph Bunch, or Alan Locke. So did Dr. Love's activities influence Garvey and D.T. Went and others of that ilk. So in addition to Love, a man by the name of J. Albert Thorne, who actually coined the phrase Africa for Africans, Whoa. modeled for Garvey the process of creating the focus on a back to Africa philosophy. Africa is our ancestral home, he said. Our fathers were kidnapped therefrom and led away into captivity, and moreover, we, their sons and daughters, are not enlightened and some at least are desirous to return and settle down in their fatherland. Garvey took and built upon the work of Thorn to build a philosophy and a foci for the UNI, the UNIA. The point is, is that revolutionary activism comes from revolutionary thinking. Revolutionary thinking comes from imbibing from the tall glass of wisdom poured out by the thinking revolutionary. All practice that's worth anything is informed by theory. Thought first, action next. All practice is informed by theory and so for a movement to exist, People must be organized, and organization cannot be created without intense thought, meticulous mapping, planning, and projection, and must be fueled by a passion that cannot be extinguished. Because revolutionary movements come equipped with detractors, haters, spies, quitters, non-believers, enemies, ops, predators, and parasites. Right, right. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. As a historian, y'all, it was okay, it's all right. Somebody must have felt hit, it's okay. As, as a historian, I'm clear as to how the past continually impinges upon the present. So here's the deal, as I see it in the here and now of this right now moment, according to my research and my reflection. Let me just take you down this road for a minute. Because what I discovered while I was studying for this, these men whose names I have mentioned, they wrote down what they thought. If they didn't write it down, we would not be able to recall and rehearse what they thought today. The difference between a genius and a fool is one just talks and the other writes it down. And so I have written for you part of my understanding of where we are as it relates to those who would see themselves as our enemies in this present moment. So, we're currently being consumed by our oppressors. Biological science views predation as having four major types. Carnivory, herbivory, mutualism, and parasitism. Carnivory is simply means just to kill and eat. It's a kill and eat relationship between organisms. While herbivory includes some consumption that does not necessitate death, but that could eventuate in a benefit from the victim of the predation. Mutualism suggests a mutually beneficial relationship between the predator and the prey. 
However, parasitism is a complex interaction characterized by prolonged energy depletion by one organism, a predator, that is smaller than the prey. Parasitism is a form of predation where the host supplies essential nutrients for the sustained survival and reproduction of the parasite. In many successful parasitic interactions, the host suffers a loss of energy, falls sick, or loses access to nutrients. However, unlike carnivory, the host is not always killed. In most cases, the parasite is much smaller than the host. And so for the purposes of this address, parasitism best describes the relationship between black people and persons who classify themselves as white because African descent persons labor, creativity, and ingenuity, as well as African natural resources, largely sustain Europe and persons of European descent through unfair and exploitative practices that leave black people energy depleted, sick, and at a loss for what we need to survive. What we survive. Additionally, whites are the global minority because they make up an estimated 14% and dropping of the world population, which corresponds to the size difference that I referenced when I made a description of what a parasite and a host looks like. The host is always bigger than the parasite. We the host, and we hosting a parasite that we allow to attach to our brains and attach to our pockets and to suck out whatever they want whenever they get ready until we don't want it to happen like that no more. The parasitic relational parameters between Europeans and Africans are best described in terms of economics. It may be that the economics of a certain kind of society are driven by the desire of a small dominating few to hoard all of the resources which are perceived to be scarce and then deploys a myth, legend, civil folk ethic, and a pseudo-morality anchored in authority by virtue of connection to divinity, which is codified in the imposition of a systematic miseducation program. What I'm saying is, they start with the black church. They start running us crazy with the idea that whites are to be in authority by nature. And once we are softened up through years and years of being trained that we are second class, at one point or another, we accept what they teach us. Economist Malice Bart Williams brilliantly explicate, explicates this exploitative relationship between Europe and Africa. She begins her explication of the operationalization of the parasitism with a irony-filled question. She said, one thing that keeps me puzzled despite having studied finance and economics at the world's best universities. The following question remains unanswered. Why is it that 5,000 units of African currency is worth one unit of European currency? Let me have all the resources. When all of the gold resources and reserves are in Africa. How, how they do that? It is quite evident that the aid is in fact not coming from America and Europe to Africa, but the aid is going from Africa and giving welfare to people in Europe and America. But they got us thinking, they got us thinking that, they, that oh, please send money to the children in Africa. And they got the same three babies with flies on them that they show every time. And then we send our money to them. But what that is, what that is, that's, that's best described as poverty pornography. Yes, yes. 
See, see, what they do is attempt to convince us that we need aid from the West while, while the West keeps benefiting from the free aid that's coming from Africa by systematically destabilizing the wealthiest African nations and their systems and all that backed by these huge PR campaigns leaving the entire world under the impression that Africa is poor and dying and merely surviving on the charity that comes from America and, the West. and, and Europe. That's the game. That's how, that's how the game works. But have you ever wondered how things work in nature? Because Marcus Garvey always said it's natural for black people to have sovereignty over our own affairs. So, so, do you want to know how things like this work out in nature? One would assume, you know, with survival of the fittest that the one who is the greatest predator will be able to remain on top. That's not how it works in nature. When a predator becomes too strong and begins to consume everything, what happens is the ecosystem becomes unbalanced and it will no longer support them and they die out. That's what happens in nature. That's what happens in nature. So I'm leaving you. Because I done bird worried you and bored you too long. Take your time, brother. Marcus Garvey understood that black people the world over are not at the welcome table. We on the menu to be consumed. Our artistry, our creativity, our thoughts our ideas, our bodies are being consumed by them and we have actually been tricked into offering up ourselves to them as a sacrifice. But we must, as Killer Mike say, plot, plan, strategize, organize and stay unified. The truth of the business is that I am because we are and because we are Therefore I am, and I am crystal clear that if there were no Marcus Mosiah Garvey, I couldn't even think the thoughts that I think. All right, all right. If, if, I, I, I would have had no space to learn of the possibilities of black sovereignty and black liberation. As Garvey said, as we look over the great stage upon which so many billions since creation have played their part, we find but few illustrious actors remaining. The rest of the performers have just come and gone without leaving behind an impression on this stage of life. Among the few who have found a place, we call their names every day because there are no other names to call. History does not remember people who go along to get along. History does not remember those who play their part. History only remembers those who agitate. History only remembers those who put up a fight and who make a fuss. People, please understand, history does not remember the diplomat. History remembers the warrior. Without Garvey, it can be argued that there would be no Honorable Elijah Muhammad, no Albert Clegg, Honorable Brother Jeremoja Abibi Ajayman, no Malcolm X, no Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan upon whose names we could call. Without Garvey, there would be no Nation of Islam, no Moorish temple, no shrine of the Black Madonna, no Black Panther Party, or Black Lives Matter. Without Garvey, there would be no Bob Marley, 
No steel pulse. No sizzler. No Nina Simone. No Lauren Hill. No KRS One, Chuck D, or Public Enemy. Without Garvey, there would be no reason for us to gather, to celebrate, to remember. Because without Garvey, there would be no names to call. God bless you. I hope you can hear that I love you. God bless you. Put your hands together for Reverend F. Peace.